Good morning and welcome to our service this morning. We're really, really glad to have you with us. I hope you're doing well. Uh, I hope you're you're avoiding this virus and uh, staying healthy and safe. Uh, we really are glad that we can be together this way. I realize it's, it's not the best, but um, it has really been a blessing to us during this time, particularly for those of you that just, you know, just have not been able to come out. I... Uh, I'm so thankful for this. You know, today I am one of the phrases and we're going to be looking at Hebrews chapter six. And one of the phrases is you know, tasting the, the heavenly gifts, uh, the gifts that come to us from God. What are the gifts that you have in your life that come from God? I, do you ever think about that? I want you to think about it right now. You know, um, so I think about some of the gifts in my life. I mean, uh, my wife, that um, that a woman would walk this path with me. Uh, wow, that's that's a gift from God that God would give me someone that that could you know stay right with me. That's that's amazing. You know, our our kids, uh, grandkids. Hey, nobody's going to argue about grandkids. We might, right. These are gifts from God. But but what other gifts do you have from God? Um, what are what are some of the heaven the the spiritual gifts you have from God? Do you ever think about that? Uh, what what does it what? Uh, how how do I say this? What's so great about the Holy Spirit living inside of you? And I mean that is a real question. Why is that great? What do you like about it that the Holy Spirit would live inside of you? These are just some of the things that the Hebrew writer is going to talk about that um, he's, it's kind of how he's defining what it means to be a Christian. So uh, I want you to think about that. But you know, the psalmist, uh, Psalm 34, said this, Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Have you tasted and seen how good God is that it um and it's funny that the psalmist used that word taste and the Hebrew writer is going to in our passage is going to use it twice um that there is kind of a, a flavor to God and an aroma to God they talk in other places they talk about it um but in all of this is the goodness of God I hope that, that together this morning, we will celebrate the goodness of God and that you will even beyond our time together will celebrate the goodness of God. Let me lead us in a word of prayer. Father, thank you for being so good to us. You, you are good. You are wise and loving and strong. And those are all good qualities that we're so grateful for. Not to mention, Father, the, the sending of your son, his, his sacrifice on our behalf, the cross, the resurrection. These are all gifts of ours that from you that we're so thankful for. And our, even our salvation that you tell us so many times, it's a gift. I'm giving it to you. Thank you, Father. Thank you. I pray, Lord, that you would hold us in your in your hands and you would hold us together. I pray all this in Jesus name. Amen. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth 
and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Before the throne of God above, I have a strong and perfect plea, a great high priest whose name is love, whoever lives and pleads for me. My name is graven on his hands, my name is written on his heart. I know that while in him he stands, no tongue can bid me this depart. No tongue can bid me this depart. When Satan tempts me to despair and tells me of the guilt within, upward I look and see him there. Who made an end to all my sin? Because a sinless Savior died, my sinful soul is counted free. For God the just is satisfied to look on Him and pardon me. To look on Him and pardon me. Lamb, my perfect spotless righteousness, the great unchangeable I am, the King of glory and of grace. One with himself I cannot die, my soul is purchased by his blood. My life is hid with Christ on high, with Christ my Savior and my God, with Christ my Savior and my God. Harsh words from somebody we love can, can hurt. Um, it can be hard to take. You know, I remember 
a couple of times when I was little being rebuked by my, by Papa, my grandfather. Um, one time I even got a little, a little swat on the rear end. And, uh, yeah, I, <laughs> I still remember, uh, because it's, it's just kind of crushing sometimes to get harsh words from somebody like that. I don't know if, if you've ever had a grandparent have to get on to you, uh, sometimes that can, that can hurt more. Um, the book of Hebrews. So, so we're working our way through the book of Hebrews and there's, there's some characteristics of the book is I love the book. And, and one of the reasons I love the book is it, it's, it's very different than, than other books of the Bible. And so, um, I, I enjoy this book, but, um, there's some harsh ways that, that this writer um, talks. Like, like, for instance, let me give you just a, you know, two or three examples. One is, you know, the Psalm 119 talks about the, the word of God. And it says, your word is a lamp for my feet and a light for my path. You know, we know that song. I, I actually really like the song. Well, in Hebrews, when it talks about the word of God, it's not talking about lamps and lights. It says that the, that the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. That's, that's a lot harsher than a, a, a lamp for my feet and a, and a light unto my path. Um, also, even just the, the description of God. Okay, so John, in 1 John chapter 4, describes God this way. God is love. Okay, and, and, and we all know that. And there's, again, we have songs about that, that God is love. Well, in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 28, says God is a consuming fire. Um, so I'm just saying, they just kind of talk about the same thing, but they use harsh, harsh language. Um, the hands of God, uh, in, in first Samuel, second Samuel 24, David has, you remember when David did the census of Israel and he had, they, they counted the, the army and God was very displeased with David for doing that. And he, and he sent, uh, the prophet Gad to David to say, you got three choices. I'm going to punish you. Which of these do you want? And David said to Gad, I am in deep distress. Let us fall into the hands of the Lord for his mercy is great, but do not let me fall into human hands. So David is just saying, I would rather fall into the hands of God. Okay. Well, in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 31, it says, it is a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Now, all I'm trying to say is this. In the book of Hebrews, it, it talks about some of the same things that are talked in other places in the Bible, but it's much harsher. All right. So I think that applies to what we're going to talk about today. Hebrews chapter 6, verses 4 through 6. This is a tough passage. Um, you, you'll realize why it's tough when you read it. So let's just start here in verse four. It is impossible for those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift, who have shared in the Holy Spirit, who have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the coming age, and who have fallen away to be brought back to repentance. To their loss, they are crucifying the son of God all over again and subjecting him to public disgrace. All right, before we really get into this, let's have a word of prayer. Father, we're looking into this scripture that, that, that seems harsh. I pray, Father, you would help us to understand what you're trying to say to us. I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. So he talks, he, he he, he, he really kind of talks about five things. And I really sort of see it as this is kind of his description of what it's like to be a Christian. So he, he says, first of all, that, that, that somebody has been enlightened, that you've been enlightened. And I think part of what he means by that is that we move from living in darkness. And when you live in darkness, you, there, there's hatred and jealousy and abuse 
etc. Okay, that's that's living in darkness and it's not good. It's not peaceful, but God brings light to our world and he changes things. Uh, and suddenly there's sunshine in our life. There's blue sky and there's love and there's peace and there's the goodness and righteousness of God in our life. That's enlightened. You have been enlightened. And, and, and it's also understanding the truth of God where you are now living by God's truth instead of just by your, by your, the whims of yourself. Living by your own whims is horrible. But living by the truth of God is, is great. That's enlightened. You've been enlightened. Then he goes on to say, who have tasted the heavenly gift. The heavenly gift. This is a phrase that is used almost none in, in, in the New Testament. But I really believe he's talking about the gifts that we receive from God. Certainly, that would include salvation. Salvation is a gift from God. And, and Ephesians chapter 2 makes it extremely clear that that's what it is. It is a gift from God. But, but that's not all we receive from God. We don't just receive salvation. We also receive love. Romans talks about God pouring his love into our hearts. That's a gift. Thank you, God. I need love in my life. Everybody needs love in their life. Forgiveness. That's also a gift from God. Peace. Uh, meaning in our life new relationships and a new way of relating to people. These, this is the heavenly gift. Then he, he goes on to talk about who have shared in the Holy Spirit. We know what it means to have the Holy Spirit live in us. You know that. If you are a Christian, you know what it is like to have the Holy Spirit live inside of you. Do you, do you realize that that we have this gift from God that we can we can talk to God or 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 use you want to call it something different pray okay we can pray just by thinking we don't have to shout we don't have to say it in some particular way we can just think it because the holy spirit of god is living inside of us we're not shouting all the way to heaven we don't have to find some way to get the message through this long distance He's living right here. Don't have to shout. You don't even have to say it out loud. You can just think it. Isn't that incredible? Shared in the Holy Spirit. That's just one thing. Uh, he also says this. Who have tasted the goodness of the word of God. The, tasted the goodness of the word of God. This is now the second time he's talked about tasting. The goodness of the word of God, it really applies in this book. You remember where he kept saying, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Today, if you hear his voice, though, if you have learned to taste the goodness of the words of God, the richness of listening to God speak through the Bible, we have that. That is a, a beautiful thing. Don't take it for granted. Don't. The life of Jesus. We listen to the words of God through the life of Jesus. And when we, when we, when we read of, about Jesus, we are hearing, he's called the word of God. So this, this is, these are just beautiful things. And, and, and he closes this part by saying, and the powers of the coming age. It's sort of, you've tasted the goodness of the powers of the, of the coming age. And, and that is a, a foretaste of what is coming that and that as Christians you get that you that is that is put into you and you you experience that and a word for that is hope we have hope that we we know there is something really good coming and that's a part of our life and and we taste the goodness of that to have that in your life and, and it causes inside of us this longing for the beauty to come, but not only like a longing, but just the fact that, that there, that there is that is such a blessing to us. Okay. So he's talking about all of these things that, that really is what it means to be a Christian. You've been enlightened. You've tasted the heavenly gift. You've shared in the Holy Spirit. You've tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of this coming age. And then he goes on to say, 
and who have fallen away. And remember, he's talking about it's impossible. This is a long sentence, okay? It's impossible for those that have done everything that he has just said, but then they fall away. It's impossible to bring them back to repentance. Um, scary. Scary. He, he, he goes on to say, to their loss, they are crucifying the Son of God all over again and subjecting him to public disgrace. Um, the negative testimony of an ex-Christian is powerful. It's powerful in a negative way. It rattles Christians. It, unlike the testimony of an ignorant person that doesn't know God. And so, so we can all say, well, you know, they just don't realize the goodness of God. They haven't tasted the goodness of God or the, the Holy Spirit or the powers to come. All of this that, that, that the Hebrew writer is using to describe Christianity, well, they don't know about that. So yeah, they kind of rant and rave about Christianity and say, you know, blasphemous things. But when it's somebody that was a Christian, that, that does know all that. Um, basically saying, you know, I tried all that. It really, it was a joke. It's not real. Um, they're misguided people. I've, I've been right there. And, and that's hurtful. And it's, it doesn't just it, it, like I said, it rattles Christians. We can really be rattled and we can have our faith rattled. And, and, and sometimes younger Christians will feel like, oh, is this what, is this what I have to look forward to? Is this what's going to happen to me? Am I going to eventually toss this too? And that's scary. And it is, it is scary. Um, the thought of, of re-crucifying Jesus, subjecting him to public disgrace. It is, it's all personal to Jesus. The book of Hebrews explains better than any other book in the Bible, the personal nature of Christianity to Jesus Christ. Christianity is connected personally to him. So we need to deal with the word impossible, though, because he's talking about it, it being impossible to bring that person back to repentance. And it just sounds like what, what it sounds like is there, there is a there's a place you can get to to where it's all over. You're lost. There's no returning. The grace of God no longer applies. The love of God is no longer available to you. You have gone too far. The problem with that line of thinking, okay, so when Christians think that way, that you can get beyond the love of God, that there is a time when God says, all right, that's it. You you went too far. We're, we're finished. I'm no longer, I'm no longer willing to save you. I'm no longer willing to, to offer you repentance. I'm no longer willing to anything. The truth of the matter is I don't love you anymore. When we believe that, then, then that cuts both ways there's a bite to it because it also deep inside we realize maybe that's me maybe he's going to do that same thing to me if you can get beyond the love of god i do not believe that you can get beyond the love of god but but let me let me deal with impossible first i wish that i could use the greek to change the word <laughs> but I can't, that would be improper use of the Greek. Um, but there's, there's, there's a couple of things that I want us to understand. Do you remember when Jesus was addressing rich people, the, the notion of rich people entering the kingdom of God? And he said to his disciples, truly I tell you, it is hard for someone who's rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. And when the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished and asked, well, who then can be saved? Because in their mind, the rich would be first. And, and Jesus saying, no, they are, it's impossible for them to get in. 
And, and it's just shocking to them. And Jesus looked at them and said, with man, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. I think this is important to what he is saying here. I believe that the writer is using harsh language to sober us up. Do not take this for granted. God will not be mocked. Okay. The other times in scripture where it talks about God being mocked, it has more to do with, with our finances. But I really believe in this case, he's saying the same thing. You, you do not mock me on this subject. Stop acting like, eh, repentance is no big deal. It is a big deal. I believe he is also talking about that we are not capable of overriding someone's will. Parents experience this all the time when their, their children walk away from the faith that they grew up, they grew up with. And it's, and it's hard on parents. I've known parents that have died with this heavy heart for one of their children that have walked away from God. And, and it, is, it is extremely hard on them. We, this is why the Hebrew writer has said to us in so many ways, you have got to take this serious. The well-being of your brothers and sisters really matters. And, and, and here in chapter six, he sort of says why it matters. Because when they walk away, after they have tasted all of this and decided, no thanks, I don't, I don't like this. I want something different. Um, Jesus is fine for you, but he's not fine for me. Um, you will not be able to, to pull them back. You just can't. Now, I do believe that the impossibility is with us, not with God. Okay? So the God who goes after one lost sheep and the God who runs to meet his lost son can do what is impossible for us. The God who would put himself on the cross for us can do the impossible, but we cannot. I do believe that our hearts can become so hard that we will not come back. And this is the impossible, this is part of what he's talking about with the impossibility that you just, you won't, you can't, you get so stubborn, you get so prideful, you will not admit that you were wrong, which is what you, you must do to repent. You cannot turn around and go a totally different direction without saying the direction I was going was not right. This is what he says that I just referred to in Hebrews chapter 3, 12 and 13. See to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God, but encourage one another daily as long as it's called today so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. That last phrase, hardened by sin's deceitfulness. This is what he's talking about. You become hardened and you just will not you will not change. I remember back in Canada, a, a member, one of our members, their son that grew up in the church and everybody in the church knew he had grown up in the church and, and he got married and he had kids, but, but, he, but he left the church and he got a three-year warning because, that he was dying of cancer. And you would think, well, with a three-year warning, maybe he would turn his life around. Did he? No, not at all. He did not use that time to get right with God. He, he, he'd become hardened by sin's deceitfulness. I, I, I knew another man that was dying, and he was in a semi-coma. I've, I've probably I've told you this story before. And his dad sent me back there at the hospital. Would you please go pray with Mark? And so I go back there, but who Mark is in a semi-coma, uh, his, you know, he, he becomes agitated and his wife says to me, he doesn't want you to pray with him. And it's like, I know he doesn't want me to pray with him. I, I knew it, you know, his dad asked me to do this anyway. So, so I, I didn't and, and I left 
He died 10 minutes later, 10 minutes before he dies. He will not repent. He will not ask help from God. This is why this writer is saying, do not take the gift of repentance for granted. Do not do that. This is way too precious of a thing. Another thing I think he's trying to help us understand is that God is not Santa Claus. Do you, do you, 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 did you grow up that if you're good, you know, Santa will bring you gifts if you're bad? When I was a kid, it was a lump of coal. He's going to bring you a lump of coal. Did anybody get a lump of coal? I didn't know anybody. And I, I, I guarantee you, you know, there were kids at school. They were bad. They were bad kids at school. And what did they get? They got lots of presents. That's just, that's Santa Claus for you. But that's not God. Do you remember the flood? The story of the flood? Is God serious? Yes, he's serious. Do you remember the fall of man and, and the banishment from Eden? Do you remember how horrible that was? But do you also remember that in all of this, the love of God never stops. It never stops. We do not get to the edge of God's love. Jeremiah said it this way. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies are new every morning. That love does not cease. Prophets, apostles, Jesus, psalmists tell us this, that the love of God is constant. This is not a commentary about God's love. It's a commentary about our nature. We like to think that we are all in control. Do you know how many people I've, I have said straight to me, I can repent anytime I want. Do you realize how prideful that is? It, it, people will say, when I'm ready, and I really believe they think, well, God has to take me back. That's his job. That's just what he does. So when I'm ready, I'll repent and God will take me back. And I really believe what they're saying is I'm the customer. I'm the customer here. And the customer is always right. You know, the story of the prodigal son is not just about the father's heart. It, it is, but it's not just about that. It is also about how hard it is to repent. And it was that that boy in that story had to go way, way, way down before he was finally willing to repent. And what a miracle it was that he did. And the father, it, 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 the, the father's heart, which represents God, was absolutely open to that boy. He had not gone beyond his love. He had not gone beyond the father's ability to forgive him. But he had come awfully close to being so hardened by the deceitfulness of sin that he would not come back. Here's one thing I believe, that every single person that God sends to hell will be someone he loves. That is, so when we, when we, when we try to get our, our arms around this passage and, and the, the very harsh warning that it is to us to not take this for granted, and, and throughout the book of Hebrews, he keeps repeating this same kind of message, how important it is to stay with God, stay with God all of your life. I really believe that the reaction that this passage elicits is humility before God. Forgive my pride, Lord. Hold me close and never let me walk away. And to, and to have that attitude that says, I will not walk away, no matter what. I will not walk away. It's not that I'm scared that God won't accept me back. I'm scared I won't come back. 
that I will become so hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. And instead of being enlightened, as he talked about here, I will be deceived. And the darkness will come back into my life. And I will no longer experience the Holy Spirit and the heavenly gifts and the, and the beauty of God's word and the beauty of the powers of the coming ages. I will let that go. And in a sense, I will forget about that. And all I will be left with is my own pride. God, never let us do that. May, may God never let us walk away like that. And may we always take this serious, that this is not some light thing. It's just, ah, you can come back anytime. Yeah, don't worry about it. Yeah, it's gonna be, everything's gonna be fine. This is dangerous stuff. It's dangerous stuff. And that's why the Hebrew writer says, I've, I've got to make you aware of just how serious this is. Let's bow in prayer. Father, hold us close. Hold us tight. May we never, ever, no matter whatever happens, may we never walk away from you. May we never let go of your hand. Please, Father, help us through whatever life throws at us, the ups and downs, the sometimes the horrors of life, the, the hardness that can come. Protect us from that, Lord. And may we, as we look around at our brothers and sisters, may we, may we feel a, a, a sense of, uh, I, I, I can't let you walk away. Please don't walk away, because if you do, you might not come back. And that's hurtful so deeply hurtful. We love you, Lord. Love the fact that your steadfast love never ceases. Praise God for that. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. As I went down in the river to pray, studying about that good old way, and who shall wear the starry crown? Good Lord, show me the way. Oh, sisters, let's go down, let's go down, come on down. Oh, sisters, let's go down, down in the river to pray. As I went down in the river to pray, studying about that good old way, and who shall wear the robe and crown, good Lord, show me the way. Oh, brothers, let's go down, let's go down, come on down, come on, brothers, let's go down, down in the river to pray. As I went down in the river to pray, studying about that good old way, and who shall wear the starry crown? Good Lord, show me the way. Oh, fathers, let's go down, let's go down, come on down. Oh, fathers, let's go down, down in the river to pray. As I went down in the river to pray, studying about that good old way, and who shall wear the robe and crown? Good Lord, show me the way. Oh, mothers, let's go down. Come on down, don't you want to go down? Come on, mothers, let's go down, down in the river to pray. As I went down in the river to pray, studying about that good old way, and who shall wear the sorry crown, good Lord, show me the way. Oh, sinners, let's go down. about that good old way.
Good morning, church. I'd like to open by reading 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 16 through 17. It is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we can give thanks a, a participation in the blood of Christ, and it is not, and is it not the bread that we break a, a participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body, for we all share one loaf. Have you ever thought about a word that you thought you knew what you it meant, but then one day you decide to look it up and you find out, wow, it's kind of what I thought it was, but there's a whole lot more depth and breadth to that me to the meaning of that word. And that's what I want to talk a little bit about today with communion. We're at the point of that service that we celebrate that death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. And let's think, what does the word communion mean to you? It can be as basic as people simply getting together and gathering, sharing a meal, something of like nature, or it can go a lot deeper than that. It can, for example, mean things such as sharing, community, participation, which are things that we probably do in generally with Christians and people of the world. But let's, let's again, let's look a little deeper than that. It's going to be intimate association. It's going to be sharing sympathy, sharing confidence, sharing exchange of thoughts, priorities, purposes, discipline. These are all things that encompass the notion of communion. And you might have a few of these things with some very good friends, maybe a few work colleagues. Most certainly, you have these feelings with Christians and your spouse. Let's look at now what it means to us as a body. We, in our communion with the Lord, is it's a very simple celebration. We have some unleavened bread and we have some fruit of the vine and something that you can get just about anywhere in the world. But that emotion, but that connection, that communion that we have with us, with Christ, and as you look all around yourself, almost a 360 degree look, that is communion. When we share again these deep emotions and then we discover the depth and breadth of this unfathomable uh, gift that we have received. I would like to close by reading Luke chapter 22, verses 14 through 15. And when the hour had come, he sat down with the twelve apostles with him. And he said unto them, With desire I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say unto you, I will not eat therefore until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took the cup and gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. And he took the bread, gave thanks, and brake it, and gave unto them, saying, This is my body, for which is given to you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's pray for the bread. Our Father in heaven, we are so thankful for this time together. We're thankful for this sacrifice that that Jesus made for us. We're, we're thankful for this, this very simple, yet meaningful and wonderful memory that he had left for us. And Father, we ask at this time, as we partake of this bread, that you help us to, our minds to go back to that cross and be so ever thankful for that great sacrifice. We ask this through your son's name. Amen. As I went down in the river to pray, studying about that good old way, and who shall wear the starry crown? Good Lord, show me the way. Oh, sisters, let's go down, let's go down. Let's have a word of prayer for the fruit of the vine. Our Father in heaven, as we continue this remembrance of that great sacrifice, we ask that you help us to recall the blood, the, the, the suffering and the sacrifice that Jesus gave up for us, Father, so that we could have a place with you in heaven someday. Father, we again ask you to help our minds go back to that time, to remember it. And Father, we ask this through your son's name. Amen. Come, come on down. Oh, sisters, let's go down down in the river to pray as i went down in the river to pray studying about that good old way and who shall wear the robe and crown good lord show me the way oh brothers
let's go down, let's go down, come on down, come on. Good morning. Thank you so much for joining us um, on this Sunday morning and for allowing us to come into your home and to share God's word with you. We thank you, Alan, for the time that you put in to share God's word with us um, and to, to just to show the love of God. And there's so much going on in this world today, and we want everybody to be smart and to be safe, especially with this COVID and the new COVID that's going around. We know people are afraid, but there's one thing that we can be sure of, and that's God himself. He will never leave us. He will never forsake us. I want to share with you just a few words from in Romans um, in chapter chapter 8, um, where it talks about that we're more, more, we are more than conquerors. And I'm sure you're familiar with it. Starting in verse 37, it says, that no, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I'm convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So he loves us that much that there's nothing that can separate us from his love. There's nothing that can separate us from each other's love as, as a Christian family, as brothers and sisters in Christ. We may not be all able to meet in the church building, but it's one thing for sure is we are all still united, and that's through Christ, that's through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we are so thankful for Him. We've been talking a lot at home about being reflections of God in 1 John chapter 3. And it says that, that in that, how great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. In verse 2 it says, Dear friends, now we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. So when it, when it says we shall be like him, that means we're going to be reflections, reflections of God. And I pray that through this pandemic, we are all reflections of God. Christians should not change. We should still have that love for each other, that care for each other. <clears throat> Excuse me. And again, there's so much going on today. There's so many sicknesses along with the virus, um, the COVID. Um, there's so many other illnesses that, that people are going through. There's shut-ins. We need to remember those by sending them a card, a phone call, um, just, just something. Prayers is, is definitely the best thing that we could do. Um, but we want to be there for everybody. So again, thank you for allowing us coming to your home. Thank you for, for sharing this time with us. We look forward to one day we will all be back together again. Because remember, God has already won, won the war. This is just a battle. And Christ will overcome this battle. But we have to allow him and to show through us. Would you bow with me in prayer? Lord, we thank you so much for the day you've given us, and we thank you for life, every breath that we take, and every beat of our heart. Um, Lord, we just we want to be able to 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 come to you in everything, and we know that we can because we have that faith, we have that trust that you're over there with us, holding us by the hand, with your arm wrapped around us, walking through this this time with us. And we thank you, Lord, for that confidence and that strength, because we can't do these things on our own, but we came with you. Again, we thank you, Alan, for the, the lesson that you uh, shared with us. And we pray, Lord, that uh, uh, you be with us, that you continue to love us, um, and that we just uh, we show love to each other. We, all, we, pray, we, we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death.